I will show you a situation that range is not a good measure of dispersion. The first data set is one, 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 four, four, and seven, seven, seven. Second data set, one, four, 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 and seven. What is the size of the, let's call this data set A and this data set B. Uh, how many numbers are in the first data set? Eight. And how many numbers are in the second data set? Eight. Okay, so we write it down. You know, we want to exp you know, explain, this chapter is about descriptive, so we want to describe our data. So number of observations in these two, uh, let's say these are the grades in an exam or the final exam of an exam uh, you know, the maximum grade is seven and the smallest grade is, you know, lowest grade is one. Now, um, so number of observations is this. What is the average of the first data? So let's say this is the whole number of students in the class. So we use Greek letters. It's the whole population. What is the average of the first data set, ladies and gentlemen? Four. So the mean of this data set is four according to your friends. So I want all of you to create this table. Now, what is the mean of the data set B? Four. Okay, so this is also four. So mean is four in both data sets. What is the median of data set A? What, what is the definition of median? Half of the observations are less than it, half of the observations are more than it. So what is the median of A? Four. What is the median of B? Four. Yeah, half of the observations are less than four and half of the observations are more than four. And, you know, when we want to, and the range is from one to seven in both. Range, one to seven. Range, one to seven. Now I want you to focus on the data sets, X's, the values in the data. If you are a very good student, in which class would you register your name? Notice that we are talking about two classes. Their number of students is the same. The mean is the same. Median is the same. Range is the same. But if you are a good student, in which class would you register? A. Why A? You have a better possibility of getting seven. Exactly. Like, look at there. Three out of, three out of eight are getting a perfect mark. So if you're a good student who needs a GPA of A+, plus, you would register your name in there. In class B, it seems that everybody is getting a mediocre mark. So there is something in the dispersion of this data that is not revealed by, even if we know everything, mean, median, mode, and all of those uh, range, still, um, there is something in these two data sets that is different. Um, if I want to call that difference the dispersion, which data set is more dispersed? Notice that I want your intuition to give the answer. And then later we want to find a mathematical indicator, statistic. We want to find a mathematical construct that co is consistent with your intuition. Which data set is more dispersed A. from the mean? Why? 
uh, because there's more other possibilities. There's more ones and sevens and less yeah, so like which are far from the mean. Yeah, one is far from the mean. Seven is far from the mean. So I can claim that A is more dispersed. Look at B. B, everybody is getting four. It's it's basically concentrated on four, except two exceptions. Although the range is the same, A is more dispersed. So what, and in your reasoning that you said A is more dispersed, we actually thought about how far each, is, each observation is from the mean. Mean is four, and we thought, okay, one is far from the mean, seven is far from the mean. So how about we look at the deviations from the mean, and that should give us an indication of um, how far uh, this data is from the mean. So this is what we will do. We will look at the, we will look at the deviations. So how much is the deviation of the first observation is A from the mean? Minus three. Minus three, minus three. And you continue like that. I want you to fill all of the deviations in data set A and data set B, like this is minus three and zero. I don't write everything on the board to force you to do it. And then I will ask you to show me your work. Done. Got it, okay, so this would be negative three and zero and zero and three and three and three. Now, when you look at these deviations, which one is more dispersed? Now that we have all of the deviations. A. A is more dispersed. Uh, can you tell me why? Um, because for B, it's pretty much just consists of um, all the same numbers, but A, there's more variety. And I'll just look at the deviations. Yeah, most of the deviations in B are zero, but here we have deviations of negative three and positive three, okay? So it seems that, but the problem is that, can you tell me what is the sum of the deviations in A? Zero. Sum of the deviations in B? Zero. Are you surprised? No. Why not? Because the sum is always zero. <laughs> yes, so we are not surprised. The sum of the deviations, but but we know, like we see that there is a lot of positive deviations, a lot of negative deviations. So for sure, is more aim is more dispersed. But how can we like the what is causing the problem is that these we have a lot, lot of negative trees, a lot of negative positive, uh, a lot of positive trees, but. They're canceling each other and it prevents us to have a measure of dispersion here. How can we have a measure of dispersion based on these deviations? Uh, because now these negative trees and positive trees are canceling each other. Any suggestions? Because if we add these deviations as they are, they will always be zero, even though there are a lot of deviations. What can we do? You know, when we look at that negative three, we know that there is a lot of deviations. When we look at positive three, we also know that, that there is a lot of deviation. Um, but this negative and positive is hurting us. Let's say if we get the absolute value of the deviation, if we get the absolute value of the deviation, then yeah, the sign will go away. So let's do that. Absolute value of deviation is a good proposal. So this is what we will do. We will get the absolute value of deviations and instead of finding some of the deviations, we will find some of the absolute value of deviations. So here I will calculate some of the absolute value of deviations and that cannot be zero because absolute value of negative three is? Three. <laughs> and 
absolute value of zero is zero. Absolute value of positive three is also three. So they don't cancel each other. And you'll do the same thing for data set B. So what is the, what is the sum of the deviations for A? 18. And what is the sum of the deviations for B? Six. Nice, we found the measure of dispersion that quantitatively is approving what we intuitively was watching with our eyes, that A is more dispersed. Some of the absolute deviations in A is 18, some of the absolute deviations in B is six. Therefore, now we have a quantitative measure of dispersion, even though the range is the same. The range in A and B is the same, but now we, based on this measure, we can say that A is more dispersed than B. Did we achieve our goal? Yes. Yes, but I have to tell you that this is not a really good measure. Let me show you, okay? Do you see this sum of the absolute deviations in B is six and is a small? If I add some data here, like 4.1, Okay. Is 4.1 far from the mean? No. No. So I'm basically adding more data very close to the center. I add another 4.1. I'm adding the concentration to the center, right? If I add a 3.9, I'm increasing the concentration. I'm adding more to the center and 3.9 and 3.9 and 4.1. The data is getting more concentration, but six is growing to seven. And if I add more and more and more and more data to B at one point, some of the squared deviations of B becomes more than A. So some of absolute deviations is not that good because I can add more and more data into B, and at one point, then I can fool some of the absolute deviations, telling me that the B is more dispersed, while B is not actually more dispersed by adding those numbers. So what can I do to prevent this inflation of some of the absolute deviations in B? No, because as I'm adding more numbers to B, some of the deviations is growing. You know, if the number of observations is eight, some of the deviations is six. If the number of observations is nine, then it would be 6.1. Yeah, by every number that I'm adding to B, it's deviation is, absolute deviation is growing. But what can I do to compensate that growth? I tell you the proposal. The proposal is that every time that we find some of the absolute deviations, we divide it by the number of observations, okay? So in each data set, when we find some of the absolute deviations, we divide it by the number of observations. That way, as I'm growing the sum of the deviations by adding numbers to B, I'm dividing with a bigger number. Let's calculate that. So let's find uh, it's called average absolute deviations. So instead of finding some of the absolute deviations, we will compare the average of absolute deviations. So how many, it, it, it will consider how many numbers is in each data set. So what is the average absolute deviations in the uh, data set A? Uh, some was 18, number of observations is eight. So the mean absolute deviation is how much? 2.25. I didn't get the first word. 2.25. 2.25. Uh, did everybody get the same number? Yep. 2.25, okay. And what is the average absolute deviation or mean absolute deviation of data set B? 0 0.75. Did everybody get the same number? Yeah. Okay, so don't look. 
Now we have a measure of dispersion, which is mean absolute deviation. It tells us that A is more dispersed than B. Uh, a mean absolute deviation of A is 2.25. Mean absolute deviation of B is 0.75. And even, even if I put more numbers in B, yes, the sum of the absolute deviations will grow, but also the denominator will grow from eight to nine to 10. So nobody can fool me. Now, did we find a measure of dispersion that shows that A is more dispersed than B? Are we happy? Yeah. Okay, I have to tell you that we are happy, but mathematicians are not happy. Now, those of you who have had a good, um, you know, math course in your high school, you probably remember that if I want to draw the curve y equals to absolute value of x, uh, let's find what is that curve, okay? So this is x, this is y. For x zero, what is y? Zero. Yeah, for x one, what is y? One. For x negative one, what is y? Absolute okay. value of x. Would be one. Very good. For x equal to two, what is y? Two. <laughs> For x equal to negative two. 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 For x equal to negative half. Half. For x equal to half. Then half again. Yeah. So it turns out that this curve is something like this broken line. And mathematicians don't like it. You know, at this point, the slope from the right side and the left side are different. Mathematicians don't like it. And actually, if we rely on this measure of dispersion, the rest of this course is impossible. If this was the only way that we could measure the dispersion around the mean, then we have to run the final exam now and go away. So let's find a way such that this discontinuity doesn't exist and we have a more fruitful measure of dispersion around the mean uh, such that we can continue our inquiry in the witchery to predict the parameter of the population based on a statistic of the sample. Based on this mean absolute deviation, finding the parameter of the population based on a statistic of the sample is very, very, very difficult. Okay, so mean absolute deviation could be fine if it wasn't vetoed. So let's try another way. So is there a, why did we use this absolute value function at all? So we can see the deviation between the two. Um, yeah, we wanted to, yeah, we saw the deviations, but some of the deviations were negative and some of the deviations were positive. So. We got the absolute value because we wanted to get rid of the sign. Is there any other way to get rid of the sign of these deviations other than absolute value function, like another mathematical operation that would get rid of the sign of a negative number? Squaring it. Squaring, very good. Okay, so the other way that we can get rid of the sign is squaring it deviation square so instead of getting rid of the sign by getting the absolute value how about we use squaring to get rid of the sign now the deviation here was negative three squared it is nine negative three nine nine zero zero nine 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 and now we can instead of finding some of the uh, absolute deviations, we can find some of the, we can find some of deviation squares for both data sets. So this is nine, zero, zero, and you continue like that. 
and you tell me what is sum of the deviation squares instead of sum of the, uh, the absolute value of deviations. For A, it's 54. 54. And then for B, I got 18. Now we have this measure, which is sum of the squared deviations. It tells us that data set A is more dispersed than data set B. Now we have a nice measure of, another measure of dispersion. Is that good? Is sum of the squared deviations a good measure of dispersion? Divide by the sum of observation. Why would I divide it? I don't know, some, because another group might have more observations in it. Oh, it still has that problem that if I add more numbers into B, this sum of deviation squares will grow from 18 to 19. Even if my data is concentrated, this number will grow. So it's better to, instead of calculating sum of square deviations, we calculate average square deviations. Okay? And if I calculate average square deviations, then I'm not sensitive to the number of numbers. I'm only sensitive to their average uh, dispersion, so 6.75 for the first one. 6.75 and then 2.25. 2.25, okay, so this was, this is mean squared deviation. Mean squared deviation, okay. So now we found the mean square deviation, uh, and it tells us that the mean square deviation in, in A is six, mean square deviation in 6.75, in B is 2.25. So it tells us that A is more dispersed than B, similar to mean absolute deviation. The mean square deviation gives us the same result. Let's check if, um, if uh, mathematicians are happy. Okay, so we go to the mathematician and say, are you happy with this function y equals to x squared? We are squaring every number instead of getting a um, square, uh, instead of absolute value. So let's draw that function. What is the, uh, what is, if x is zero, what is y? Zero. If x is one, what is y? One. If x is minus one, what is y? Four. One, one, one. Okay. Now, if X is two, what is Y? Four. Four. If X is negative two, what is Y? Four. Very good. If X is half, Y would be 25, 0 0.25. It's like here. And for negative half would be here. So basically, if you draw this curve, you know, I tell you like, this is called quadratic curve. You probably have done it in your high school. If, if it goes down, it goes down. And when it reaches to zero, it goes smoothly and very beautifully, like extremely beautifully touches that zero and then nicely starts to go up and then goes up. Absolutely beautiful. And mathematicians love it. Doesn't have this continuity, completely continuous at zero. One curves explains everything. You know, the future of a statistics is possible with it. The mathematics can continue and we can go to our witchery. Okay. So did we find that magical measure of dispersion around the mean? Yes. Um, now I want to draw your attention to this question that I'm asking. Okay, answer me as I'm asking you the question. How far is one from the mean in this data set in A? Negative three. This one? Negative three. Negative three. And uh, how far is seven from the mean? Positive three. Three Positive. again. Yeah. And, and this measure of dispersion says the amount of dispersion is 
Is this reasonable? No. Like we are having a measure. The maximum dispersion that we have is three and our measure of dispersion is six. This is not good. Why this number is so big? Like our dispersions are three at most, but our measure of dispersion is six. What went wrong? What happened? Like, like the deviations are in the range of three and zero, but our measure of dispersion, like this mean squared deviation is 6.75. Why that is so big? Because it's squared. By squaring every deviation from the mean, we are exaggerating the deviation. Look, here, the actual deviation is three. We are using nine. <laughs> so basically, we exaggerated every deviation. That's why this gives us a very big number. So this mean squared deviation is exaggerated because we exaggerated every deviation by squaring them. Oh, oh yes, no. okay, no. mathematicians are happy. We are happy, but this is not a good measure. What can we do? Find the square root. Really? Uh, why square root? Because you're taking it back to... Yeah, exactly. We squared everything. We exaggerated that. So how about we square root it so it will be deflated, okay? So instead of relying on some of the deviation squares, we will rely on square root of some of the deviation squares divided by n. So... So instead of mean squared deviation, we use the square root of mean squared deviation. What would be the square root of mean squared deviation? 2.598. 2.598, okay. And in this case, square root of mean squared deviation? 1.5. 1 1.5, yeah. 1 okay. So now let's think about this. Is this reasonable now? For the first data set, okay, how much is the deviation of the first number? Minus three. Second? Minus three. Minus three. Zero, zero, three, three, three. And our measure of dispersion says 2.5, 2.6. That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. That is reasonable, okay? Are mathematicians happy? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, they are happy, look at this, they are happy. We are happy, we have a measure of dispersion that says data set A is more dispersed than data set B. And this 2.5 is reasonable because our maximum deviation is three. Our measure of dispersion overall says 2.7, that's very good. Now question, is this really a good measure of dispersion around the mean? Is this really a good measure of dispersion around the mean? Um, no. <laughs> yes, uh, we have had so many doubts that you may doubt this one, but this is actually the best measure. That was the end of the story. Yeah, we had to go through all the whole process, but this is a good measure. And actually, it has a name. This square root of mean squared deviation is called standard deviation. Yeah. And everybody loves it. Everybody standard deviation and even this inflated one is also loved by many people this is called variance okay so mean squared deviation has a name called variance and square root of it has a name called standard deviation how many of you had heard the name of these uh, two measures before 
Yeah, you had heard the name before, but now you see that they are actually a very rational choice of our effort to develop a measure of dispersion around the mean. Okay. Uh, for a standard deviation, we use the symbol sigma. If it is for the population, use the Greek symbol sigma. Okay. And if it is the standard deviation of the sample, we will use S, English letter. For variance, variance is square times bigger than uh, standard deviation because the standard deviation is the square root of variance. We show that as sigma square if it is the population and we show it as S squared if it is from a sample. Like in our case, it is a population. I gave you all of the data. So this was all of the data from a population. So in this case, we have to use sigma squared for the variance and sigma for the sample. If we use a standard deviation, we can, for two data sets, that their mean is the same, their median is the same, the number of observations is the same, the range is the same, we have a nice measure of dispersion that tell us uh, which one of the two data sets is more dispersed. Now it turns out that this standard deviation, this idea of a standard deviation is so powerful that enables us to do the first round of our witchery. Okay. To do the first round of our witchery, this is what we will do. I want you to take a bunch of numbers, okay? So you, you say you have a population of numbers. You don't tell me those numbers. Okay? But you will calculate their mean and their standard deviations. When you tell me their mean and their standard deviations, I will do many, many predictions about those numbers. Okay, for example, I will say at least 95% of observations that I don't see are between this and that, okay? I would say at least 90% are in that range. At least 80% are in that range. I will start making predictions about the data that I don't know. And my predictions will always be correct. Are you following me? I will do predictions that are 100% of the time. Every sentence that I say will be correct about numbers that I don't see. That's the power of a standard deviation. So let's do this witchery. Okay. So I'm going to turn off. Notice that I don't really need uh, to see your numbers. Okay. I give you five minutes to choose a bunch of numbers, okay? Let's say you choose a bunch of, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't cause trouble for yourself to, choosing, to choose very big numbers. You can choose from negative infinity to positive infinity. There are infinite possibilities for you. But if you make your numbers very big, it will make the calculations more difficult. Just choose any numbers that you want. I'm telling you that this is based on Chebyshev Theorem, it's a theorem. Theorem means that it is always correct. So don't kill yourself trying to defeat me. You would never be able to defeat me, okay? I will be always successful. I will turn my, you know, I will put down my headphones and I give you five minutes. Uh, you will decide together about a bunch of numbers. When you confirm those numbers, I want everybody to write those numbers down, okay? I don't know how many numbers you would choose, and I don't know um, what are those numbers, okay? Be quick.
Five minutes. All right. Okay. So uh, my numbers, let's say you will use your own numbers, but let's say if my numbers are two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, twenty, eighteen, and these numbers, I want to find their mean. So to find the mean, mean means average. So we will use average of these numbers. That gives us the average. And to find the standard deviation, we will use equal to, uh, oh, let me show you the, all of the functions. So we click here. Uh, we go to statistical functions. And uh, if we go down, we have a standard deviation. Estimates the standard deviation based on a sample. Okay, Calculate, calculates a standard deviation based on an entire population. And these are all of our numbers. Did, this is, you know, my numbers are, all of my numbers are this. I didn't take a sample. So I will use this one. STDEVPA, standard deviation for all of the numbers in the population, okay? And then I will select the range of my numbers Notice that mean is not one of my numbers. Maybe I highlight it. Make sure that you get the standard division of your numbers. So in my case, in, for my numbers, mean is 9.25, standard deviation is 6.01. Uh, so I want you to do this thing without telling me, type in your spreadsheet, your numbers, uh, talk with each other, uh, get a consensus that what is your mean and what is uh, the standard deviation of your numbers, and then shake your hand so I know I have to come back. Okay, so using a computer program, you tell me what is the mean and what is the standard deviation of your numbers, please. The mean is 6.5. Exactly? Then, yeah. Interesting. Okay, the standard deviation? 5.8. Two, three, eight, zero, two. Yeah, so Chebyshev says that at least uh, P percent of observations are between mean minus Um, K standard deviations and mean plus K standard deviations. Uh, so it says, he says that if you go K standard deviations above your mean, so one standard deviation, two standard deviation, and the same K standard deviations below the mean, so minus standard division, minus standard division. And then you find the observations that are in this range. He says that the percentage that are in this range are at least one minus K squared, one over K squared. The percentage of observations that are within K standard deviations far from the mean is one minus K squared at least. And because he has proven this, it's a mathematical theorem. He is always, maybe you don't hear things in your life very much that are always true, but this is one of those. He is always, 100% of the time, correct. Okay, so let's practice. I claim that at least, okay, now I go two standard deviations above the mean and two standard deviations below the mean. 
So the percentage would be one minus one. How many standard deviations I went above and below the mean? Two standard deviations, so k is two. Two to the power of two, one minus one divided by four, one minus one divided by four is 0.75. So I will claim at least 75% of your observations that I don't see are between, now I have to go from the mean to standard deviations less than it. So 6.5 minus 2 multiplied by 5.8238. And now I have to go two standard deviations above your mean, which is 2 multiplied by 5.8238. So tell me what is this? Uh, six minus two standard deviation. What is this? It's called lower limit or lower bound. What is the lower bound of Chebyshev? It should be a negative yeah. number. Negative 5.1476. That's what I got. Very good. Uh, anybody, please second this. Okay, very good. Marlani, and uh, the upper bound should be 17 something. I got 18.146. Please second it. Anyone? Yep. Okay, so I claim, just listen carefully, based on Chebyshev, I claim that at least 75% of your observations that I don't see are in this range. 100%. 100% are in this range? Yeah. Yes. I knew that, I knew that I will be correct. And notice that you had infinite choices. So let me give you another harder prediction. Like I go one and a half standard deviations. I'm now making my prediction even narrower, okay? So now I go, uh, I want to tell you if I go one and a half, a very tiny range above and below the mean. So I want to go one minus, my K is now 1.5. So tell me what is this? What percentage of observations uh, are within one and a half the standard deviations. Now I will do a very novel prediction. I'm now making it even narrower. 0.56. Okay, now look at my prediction. At least 56% of your observations that I don't see are between, okay, lower bound and upper bound. Lower bound would be 6.5 minus 1.5 standard deviation. And upper bound, I go one and a half standard deviations above, 1.5, 5.8238. This is, this is a very exciting moment because I'm putting myself at risk and I'm predicting a narrower range. So what is the lower bound? Negative 2.2357. And the upper bound? Fifteen point two three five seven. Fifteen point two three five seven. Now I'm predicting that at least fifty six percent of your observations are in this range. Now I'm putting myself in danger. Tell me how many of your observations are in this range? Eighty three percent. Eighty three percent. Of course, I will always be right. And by that, we did our first round of witchery. Beautiful.
Very beautiful. See you next class. Thank you. Bye. Think about it. Thank Think you. about it. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.